Ladies and gentlemen, may I kindly ask you to take your seat. Thank you. The Ministerial Policy Review Session of the Second Session of the United Nations Environment Assembly, Assembly is about to begin. Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Welcome to the opening of the Ministerial Policy Review Session, Healthy Environment, Healthy People. The dialogue will have as a basis the global thematic report on healthy environment and healthy people, UNEP slash EA.2 slash INF slash 5. The meeting is called to order. Her Excellency, Ms. Mary Robinson, former President of Ireland and President of the Mary Robinson Foundation and dear friend, Mr. Rahim Steiner, Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, Mr. Petri Talas, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, Mr. Andy Haynes, Professor of Public Health and Primary Care, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. I, will, I would first like to warmly welcome you to this second day of the high-level segment of the session, second session of the United Nations Environmental Assembly. We have had a very rich and interesting ministerial dialogue yesterday, which has led us to uncover very, very relevant pathways to deliver on the environmental dimension of the 2030 Agenda. This morning session aims to a diving into a more concrete discussion on a particularly relevant nexus of, for which of our countries and regions, the linkages between environment and health. A healthy environment is a precondition of the good health of people. Many diseases and conditions are linked to contaminants in our environments. The science on the health impacts of environmental pollution is growing. Recent comprehensive assessments indicated that premature death and disease can be prevented through healthy, healthier environments and to a significant degree. This environmental burden of disease could be prevented or limited by stronger policy action. We have examples at all levels of the adverse impacts of that air and water pollution, exposure to chemicals and degraded environments had in the health of people. What can ministers and stakeholders do to strengthen delivery to address environment and healthy linkages? The four core principles which underpins UNEP's approach to delivering on the environment dimensions of the 2030 Agenda are universality, integration, human rights, and innovation. These are embedded across the 17, 17 SDGs. Universally, as the 2030 Agenda is global, applying to all people in all countries, it is a shared agenda that requires a collective response from the international community, governments, business, businesses, and citizens' groups. Integration, the 2030 Agenda addresses sustainable development as a harmonious whole. Past approaches treated the social, environmental, and economic dimensions of sustainable development as disconnected pillars. But the new Agenda integrates and balances the three. Human rights and equity, the 2030 Agenda provides a pathway to a more just and sustainable world for all. It encourages a more even distribution of wealth and resources, equitable access to opportunities, information, and the rule of law, and the development of new approaches to build capacities at all levels of society. Innovation. The acceleration and transfer of technological innovations is key to delivering the 2030 Agenda. The world will need new innovation pathways that draw on formal science, traditional knowledge, and citizens' 
common sense. Important progress has been made, but challenges remain. According to the report prepared for this dialogue in 2012, an estimated 12.6 million deaths globally were attributable to the environment. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and the ecosystem which sustain us are estimated to be responsible for the 23% of all deaths worldwide, resulting also in economic, financial, and social losses, as the report says. As you all know, air pollution is the world world's largest single environmental risk to health. In the American Caribbean, the most, the most urbanized region of the world, this has become, become a major challenge. The ministers of environment of the region adopted in 2014 a regional plan of action to tackle atmospheric pollution. For example, in Costa Rica, the cost of health care for respiratory diseases account near 2% of our national GDP. Also important is to address exposure to chemicals in sectors such as, such as agriculture and mining. The env environmentally sound management of chemical substances and products and waste is essential for the protection of human health and the environment. And thus, there is an urgency to adopt measures to minimize the adverse impact and effects from the production and use of chemical substances and products and waste generation, especially in the most vulnerable populations. Equally important is the promotion of cooperation and coordination between the three conventions on chemicals and hazardous waste and the implementation of 2030 Agenda, strengthening actions aimed at the early implementation of the Minimata Convention on Mercury as well as its ratification with a view to the prompt entry into force of this instrument. We need innovative, transforming views, coordinated actions, and consistent cooperation initiatives to advance towards healthy societies and to improve health and well-being of the citizens of our planet. In line with the agreed agenda, the ministerial policy review will begin with an introductory segment in a plenary setting to introduce the thematic report. After the presentation by the executive director and the keynote addresses from dignitaries, the plenary will break into two parallel round tables addressing the same theme in a smaller setting. The ministerial round table one, which will take place in conference room one, will be co-chaired by His Excellency Dr. Tekar, Vice President of Iran, Head of the Environment Department, Islamic Republic of Iran, and His Excellency Mr. Ortega Pacheco, Minister of Environment of Ecuador. The Ministerial Roundtable 2, which will take place in Conference Room 2, will be co-chaired by Her Excellency Ms. Molewa, Minister of Environmental Affairs, South Africa, and His Excellency Mr. Flashbart, State Secretary, Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation, Building and Nuclear Safety of Germany. I now invite the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, Mr. Him Steiner, to make his introductory remarks. You have the floor. Thank you, President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists. Um, I was to make a, an introductory presentation to you, but I think in the interest of time and because of this very eminent panel that we have here, let me just offer you three framing remarks. You have the Healthy Environment, Healthy People report before you. It is a product of a joint effort that involved not only UNEP colleagues and colleagues in the environmental field, it was done in very close collaboration with our sister agency, the World Health Organization's, uh, Organization, the CBD, and many other experts in order to construct for you an agenda that looks at where are we today when we talk about healthy environment, healthy people. Secondly, this theme was chosen because, as we have said time and again over the last few days, this is the time of Agenda 2030. 
and the environmental dimension of sustainable development is as much a conceptual now as it is an implementation oriented discussion. This diagram in the report that you know, is available to you online on page 15 gives an excellent illustration of how dynamic this agenda has to be managed. In the middle is goal, sustainable development goal three, good health and well-being. And around it, we have um, lined up the other 16 SDGs in order to show the connection. And let me tell you, and that is my third point, this issue of the interface between health and environment is not a sectoral issue. It is a 2030 agenda challenge. It is about how we develop systemic solutions and how we can no longer pretend that we can solve a problem by simply taking it in its isolated form. We shared with you already a great deal of data about the pollution end, so I will not say any more on that, but let me just briefly refer, and Andy Haynes, who is here, I'm sure will speak to this in a moment. Unbeknownst to many of us, more than 60% of all human infectious diseases on the planet today are zoonotic diseases, i.e. they have a link from, if you want, wildlife and an environmental change-related set of parameters into actually then moving into human bodies and therefore affecting us. The great headline diseases of the last few years, whether it's now the Zika virus, whether it is um, SARS or MERS or bird flu, these are all zoonotic diseases and we need to begin to understand both why they are occurring, what is the link to environmental change, but also, as I have said at a press conference earlier this week, is our answer otherwise when these diseases occur, such as bird flu, to essentially eradicate all migratory birds on this planet because that is the risk that we face in looking at this only from a clinical or a pandemic management point of view and not understanding what the implications of this are. The justification for still be using a sledgehammer in the world of chemistry, namely DDT in the 21st century, is rationalized only by the, if you want, rationale of having to defend human health in the absence of other approaches. This is the age where we have satellites circling in space, where we have unlocked DNA, and we still argue and are at the point where we have to use DDT in order to combat malaria. This is why this discussion is not just about the pollution impacts on human health, it is also about ecosystems, ecosystem change, and the way we're going to try and deal with these issues in the future. Let me end by saying that I'm also very proud of the very close relationship that we have developed between the World Health Organization and UNEP. Indeed, as you will in a moment hear from Dr. Margaret Chan, my colleague, addressing you as environment ministers, I this morning by video message have also addressed the world's health ministers to underline this philosophy of working under the 2030 agenda on, I think, probably one of the most clear illustrations of what environment and health and tackling it from two different directions means in this age of SDGs. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you for, for his remark. And I invite uh, Ms. Mary Robinson, former President of Ireland and President of the Mary Robinson Foundation to make her keynote addresses. You may have the floor. Your Excellency Edgar Gutierrez, President of the United Nations Environmental Assembly, uh, Mr. Ackham Steiner, Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme, Ministers, Delegates, Distinguished Guests, Fellow Panelists, um, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. I'm delighted to return to Nairobi for the second session of the UN Environment Assembly. I welcome the increased focus on the cross-cutting issues of environment, health, and development. This is an area that I've been interested in for quite some time, particularly in how these issues intersect with the challenges of climate change and justice. I want to start with a personal story, a personal memory, if you like, which I woke up with this morning when I realized I was you know, coming to address you um, at this assembly. It goes back to my early childhood. My father was a medical doctor in a small town 
in the west of Ireland, a very poor part of Ireland, and his hinterland was a rural area. And he used to go out for very long calls to very poor houses, peasant uh, cottages. And I remember the excitement with which he spoke about rural electrification. He was so happy about rural electrification because he said it will be the end of these terrible kerosene lamps that have caused so much damage and fire and injury, medical problems, traumas. It will be the end of cooking on turf fires and people breathing in the smoke indoors. And he understood the health benefits of what was a cleaner energy, not completely clean, but at least it was electricity. At least it was light in the home and clean cooking for, uh, for the women. And that story, I think, has very much affected my approach. In essence, the threat of climate change is not just one of rising sea levels, increased droughts, and extreme weather events, although these are all the issues that will grab the newspaper headlines. It's also an insidious threat which cuts across virtually every sector of public policy. Climate change is an accelerator of land degradation. It has a major impact on human health and limits the capacities of countries to develop because, in fact, it can set back their development um, because of climate shocks. Climate also impacts the most vulnerable first and hardest, the very people who have done the least to cause it. Climate justice links human rights and development to achieve a human-centered approach, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable people and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change and its resolution equitably and fairly. The impacts of climate change on the right to health are now well understood. The 2015 Lancet Commission on Health and Climate Change documents the direct effects of the environmental impacts of climate change on human health, including increased disease vectors, food and nutrition insecurity, and mental illness. The central finding of the Commission is that, and I quote, tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. When my friend and fellow keynote speaker, Dr. Margaret Chan, who will join us by video, addressed the Human Rights Council's panel discussion on climate change and the right to health earlier this year in Geneva, she made a grim statement. She said that, and I quote her, the hard-won gains for health since the start of this century can easily be swept away by the tidal wave of health threats, threats unleashed by climate change. In this context, she identified the Paris Agreement as being not just a treaty about climate change, but also a health treaty. I'd go a step further. The Paris Agreement is an environmental treaty, it's a treaty for economics, it's a treaty of human rights, and it's a treaty of responsible global government, governance. In it, the community of nations has already identified one of the most effective actions we can take to ensure that communities do not see their right to health eroded in this century. That is, to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This target, as you know, was included in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement and came after a group of countries and one uh, person who was here, um, President Tong of the um, uh, Kiribati, was very much part of um, this movement, came together in a coalition of high ambition and pushed for a result that would be fair to the world's most vulnerable populations. According to the United Kingdom Met Office, and I'm sure we'll hear more of that from our other panelists, we're already at about one deg degree Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures. We know that many countries are suffering from severe air quality and uh, that there is um, a huge problem um, in countries of increased asthma and other uh, problems. With this level of warming, we're also seeing increases in diseases such as cholera and dengue, as well as the emergence of threats that have previously been limited, such as the Zika virus. It's clear that reducing the further warming of our planet will be key to limiting future health emergencies. 
Climate change also affects our attempts to meet the global goals um, we have set ourselves under Agenda 2030. And I very much want to reinforce the point that Akim Steiner uh, was making about um, the need for these sustainable development goals to be seen holistically. Work towards the achievement of one goal will assist in the achievement of the others. We can see this by looking at Goal 13 on climate change. Without achievement on that goal, we risk comprehensive failure in all the other goals, particularly those for zero poverty, zero hunger, and good health and well-being. So addressing these issues can often be and should be complementary. An elegant example of this can be seen in the distribution of clean cookstoves in Malawi. The traditional cookstoves are inefficient, lead to significant deforestation, and contribute to uh, respiratory disease through indoor inhalation, particularly in women, as they are frequently used in houses with poor ventilation. Through the distribution of clean cookstoves, using the social protection system, cookstoves that are made by local women, carbon emissions have been reduced. Additionally, women need to spend less time collecting firewood, giving them more time to undertake economic activity, and the negative health impacts of smoke in the house have been eliminated. So it's a win-win in many different ways um, for uh, the uh, women in Malawi, Malawi concerned. As you may know, I have recently been appointed uh, as one of the two UN special envoys of the Secretary General on El Nino and climate, recognizing that the effects of an El Nino are aggravated by climate change. This brings me to really stress that the impacts of the actions we take now are being felt already by real people in communities all over the globe. As such, we may not always be in the best position to develop appropriate responses to environmental and health impacts of climate change, because many of us don't feel quite so directly affected, as do communities in the front line, many of them here in different parts of Africa. I've just come from the African Development Bank in Lusaka, and they were talking about the impacts in so many southern African states, in Zimbabwe, in Malawi, in South Africa, in Mozambique, and I know that there has been intense flooding here in Kenya and in Rwanda. So the impacts are being felt. It's the most vulnerable that will experience the full brunt of this phenomenon. And it's they, born out of necessity, who have developed some of the most innovative solutions to deal with it. We need to listen to those people and learn from their experience to build solutions that are good for all and not divorced from reality. I'm reminded of a grassroots women, women's leader which my foundation, whom my, my foundation brought to the climate change session last week in Bonn, the follow-up to the discussions on the Paris Agreement. Her name is Rosemary Nambua, and she told me and the delegates of the conference of the growing problem of food security in her region. The accompanying hunger affected the communities, included, including the health due to poor nutrition. So Rosemary and a number of other women of the region organized themselves, providing support and communal funds to address this issue and to actually access and buy drought-resistant crops. And this has made a difference for her and other women in the community. They have more food for their families and more income to send their kids to school, along with related health benefits. Rosemary lives in Kitu County in K Kenya, just a few hours' drive from this room. And it's people like her who need to be heard if we want to take effective climate action and have sustainable development that's both fair and targeted appropriately. So what do we need to do going forward? I'm sure other panelists will add to um, the conclusions that I want to draw. We need greater linkages between the international mechanisms to ensure that climate change is mainstreamed across our efforts. We need to recognize that when dealing with the environmental impacts of climate change, we must also consider the development and health dimensions. We also need to recognize that issues of climate change, health and the environment are not just interlinked laterally, but also vertically as well. And we, might, we need to bring greater interaction between all levels of policy and decision making, which will ensure that responses meet the actual real needs, the realities on the ground. In doing so, we must listen to the people on the front lines of climate change. Often they will have the solutions we need. To achieve this, 
spaces and forums should be created to amplify their voices and stories. Um, there is a review at the moment of the work program under the UNFCCC on, on gender, and we're seeing if we can include having grassroots women included um, much more consciously in that work program. I would welcome if UNEP would also uh, try to get the voices of grassroots women and communities uh, more involved um, in your work going forward, because that voice is an expert voice. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, perhaps most importantly, we also need to get into a 1.5 degree mindset. Um, I feel that it was a great achievement to have that in the Paris Treaty, but for many developed countries, they kind of see it as a lofty aspiration and probably a bit unreal. But actually, it is the most vital thing to prevent the health damage and other damage which climate is, go is already causing and will um, increasingly cause. So it's a central pillar in ensuring that the worst environmental health and development effects of climate change are limited. And to achieve this, the majority of our remaining fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground. This is the challenge we must face going forward, and it's one I believe we're capable of meeting. Um, I really welcome the report, Healthy Environment, Healthy People, and I believe that a human rights approach will ensure that when we do meet this threat, we do it with a view to helping the most vulnerable first, as the 2030 Agenda has said. And I'd like to end by quoting a woman who was a friend of mine, probably known to many of you here, a great woman of Kenya, um, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Wangari Mathai. Um, I've quoted her quite often saying this because I think it's a phrase that actually captures the moment post-Paris. I can't think of a better way of capturing that moment than what she said. In the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called upon to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground. That time is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosen. I will now watch, we will now watch a video message from Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization, which will be followed by a keynote address from Mr. Peteri Talas, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. Greetings from the World Health Organization in Geneva. As deaths from major infectious diseases like AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria continue to decline, other preventable killers become more visible. The harm caused by air pollution and exposure to hazardous environmental chemicals is the new epidemic demanding urgent attention in the era of sustainable development. The numbers are stunning. WHO estimates that 12.6 million people die each year from exposure to hazards lurking in the environment. Some 7 million of these deaths are attributed to air pollution, which is now the single largest environmental risk to health. We know, too, that air pollution is fueling the striking rise of non-communicable diseases. Worldwide, air pollution is responsible for one-third of deaths from lung cancer, stroke, and respiratory diseases. Public health cannot tackle a problem of this magnitude using conventional tools like vaccines and medicines. Our long collaboration with UNEP has built a solid platform for joint action, but we also need full engagement from the energy transport and finance sectors. The United Nations Environment Assembly of UNEPT is a supreme body governing international environmental affairs. I thank you for making such a strong link between healthy environments and healthy people and wish you a most productive meeting. Thank you. I have to apologize, we did not Mr. have Mr. Tyler, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Ahim, for, for the invitation to come to speak to you. I'm Petteri Talas, the new Secretary General of uh, World Meteorological Organization, also in Geneva, as, as the previous uh, speaker. And uh, I'm representing a specialized agency of UN on weather, climate and water issues. And uh, if you have anything to complain about the weather, please come to, come to me. This health issue is, uh, to me personally, a very important issue uh, because I have been surrounded by medical doctors. My father is a medical doctor. My uncle was a professor of medicine at Harvard University. My daughter is studying medicine and my brother is also a medical doctor. So I'm, I have been exposed to this issue quite a bit. When I, when I started my scientific career 30 years ago, my first duty was to study air quality issues. And I would like to uh, touch three issues here during these interventions. Firstly, air quality related issues, uh, how they are related to the, the functions of uh, World Meteorological Organization. Secondly, I would like to touch uh, weather and uh, disease uh, interlinkages. And uh, thirdly, I would like to touch uh, the impacts of uh, climate change uh, today and also in the future on, on health. And that's perhaps one of the issues that is most uh, striking and uh, that was already touched by the, by the previous uh, speakers. Firstly, about air quality, uh, we have uh, urbanization. It's also taking place here in Nairobi. The population of Nairobi has been dramatically growing. Uh, we have also economic growth, which is uh, contributing to higher emissions, and uh, that that's we have been facing, especially in big Asian countries like China and India. And also population growth is uh, contributing to these uh, air quality problems. Uh, at WMO, uh, we, have, we are functioning very much uh, through the national uh, meteorological and hydrological services, and uh, most of them are also responsible for air quality issues. And, uh, and uh, if you, if you have, want to tackle this air quality challenge, uh, first you have to know the meteorological conditions. It's, you cannot uh, deal with that uh, without knowing, knowing the, the atmospheric uh, circulation and, and flows and, and, and so forth. And uh, then you have to have uh, measurements of air quality parameters, and typically you do, do, do at the same time the, both the meteorological measurements and uh, air quality measurements. And then you can get, uh, get rid of this exposure, what is needed uh, for health, uh, health impact uh, studies. And we are very much working together with the World Health Organization in this, uh, this field, because they have the expertise on on the health impacts, and, uh, and you have all, all seen, uh, heard that uh, impacts are fairly, fairly dramatic. In many countries, uh, it's much more people who are killed uh, because of poor air quality than are killed in traffic, uh, for example, and that's not uh, very well recognized. Uh, then we have uh, environment authorities, and uh, UNEP is uh, dealing with uh, those, and uh, we also need these emission, emission factors to be able to run air quality services and, and plan our air quality policies. Uh, and in the optimal case, you have air quality forecasts. For example, in, in China, that's, that's e even more important than weather forecasts today to have air quality uh, forecasts and, uh, because it, it has impacts on, on human health and, uh, and, and also the health of uh, children, which is, uh, which is sometimes quite a uh, sensitive issue. Besides uh, this air quality monitoring and further investments in air quality monitoring, we have to invest also in the uh, greenhouse gas uh, monitoring systems. Uh, we are eager to promote the implementation of uh, Paris Agreement, and uh, we need also scientific basis uh, to see what's happening in, in real terms. And uh, WMO and UNEP has a joint initiative to, to, to promote the global greenhouse gas monitoring uh, WMO is already running a program called Global Atmosphere Watch, where we are running uh, several stations around the world, and, and that's, that's the basis of uh, greenhouse gas monitoring, but we have to go to country level and, and see more in detail what's happening, happening in re real atmosphere. Next issue that I would like to touch uh, are these uh, weather and, uh, and, uh, and disease uh, linkages. 
there are several diseases. I'm sure that the medical community knows more about them, but uh, for example, malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, and cholera, they are very much uh, dependent on the weather conditions uh, before an outbreak of, uh, of these uh, diseases. And, uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, from our community, we are able to provide fairly good uh, seasonal predictions uh, up to three months and, and, uh, and in the coming years uh, also up to six months. And uh, these uh, forecasts and services, they are fairly good uh, at low latitude areas in Africa, uh, Asia and Latin America. And by, by issuing this kind of uh, services, one could also issue predictions on the, on the malaria season, cholera season and and so forth, and, and, and prepare uh, preventive uh, actions uh, before, before the out, outbreak of uh, these, uh, these epidemies. And at, at WMO side, we are very much working, working to enhance the service capability of, uh, of especially developing countries, and we have uh, 70 countries around the world that don't have uh, those uh, services, and, and many of them are here in, here in Afri Africa, and, and we are working very closely with uh, uh, development partners to get resources for, for implementing those, uh, those services. And we have a global framework for, for climate services, which is a, a multi-agency initiative to, to promote, uh, promote those, uh, those services. Besides uh, uh, this uh, health impact, uh, these, these services are also highly impact, important for, for agricultural services and food security. Uh, is issues and, and uh, they are part of the part of the of, of the I issue. Then, uh, uh, secondly, this weather is also related to disasters, which are not usually happening uh, uh, with a time scale of uh, six months, but rather uh, fairly in a short uh, time scale. And uh, 80 percent of the disasters they are related to weather. And uh, because of climate change, we have seen an increase. Uh, in the amount of heat waves, uh, in the amount of uh, drought, for example, this uh, last year there was severe drought in uh, Ethiopia and uh, Zimbabwe, for example. And uh, then uh, we have, uh, in some parts of the world, we have been seeing more often flooding to take place, and also we, we are observing more often most intense uh, tropical storms. Uh, and, uh, and and these are also contributing to human losses, but especially they are contributing to economic losses, and, and these economic losses have been uh, increasing really, really dramatic. And because of uh, improved weather services, we, can, we have been able to minimize the, the amount of uh, casualties. So that's good news, and, and uh, I'd like to thank the National Med Services for providing good, uh, good uh, uh, services in that, that respect. And often uh, these health problems, uh, they, they are related to disasters, but mostly people are dying and the, the, they are suffering after a disaster. One such example was uh, severe flooding in Pakistan some years ago, where there were se about 20 million people that were exposed to this uh, severe flooding, and, and uh, there were only very few people killed during the flooding, but, uh, but after the flooding there were plenty of casualties, uh, when, uh, and that's something that you should uh, take into account. And thirdly, I promised to say something about uh, climate uh, Climate change, which is also one of the hardcore uh, businesses of, uh, of WMO. And uh, as Mary Robinson said, uh, we exceeded this uh, one degree uh, warming level last year. And if you count, uh, take into account the last uh, four months, uh, we are very close to 1.5 degree warming today. And, uh, and we expect to see two degree warming to take place already in 2030. So something like 15 years from, from now. And if we want to reach those uh, low warming uh, numbers, it's very important that we start implementing the Paris Agreement and st start changing our behavior very, very, very soon. We have also exceeded uh, magic uh, 400 ppm level of uh, CO2, both in Northern Hemisphere and uh, Southern Hemisphere. Sea level rise has been 20 centimeters and oceans have been warming most of the heat that we have produced is uh, stored in the, in the oceans, and uh, we have also seen coral bleaching taking place uh, last year, which is uh, bad, bad news for the, for the ecosystems. Then we have also seen 
changes in the rainfall patterns at the higher latitudes, it's we have uh, observed more rainfall and uh, at lower latitudes like here, uh, we are more exposed to, to drought. And that's also the long-term scenario for the, for the future. And uh, with the uh, current uh, Paris pledges, we, can, we could reach a uh, three-degree warming level of the order of that. And if we are not doing anything, if we, start, if, if we use all the known fossil resources, then we could reach uh, up to eight degrees uh, warming level, which would uh, last for tens of thousands of years. So we have a very critical decades in, in, in our hands uh, at, the, at, at the moment. And uh, we es estimate that the sea level rise uh, will be of the order of 70 centimeters uh, by the end of this uh, century, even with low emission uh, scenarios. And, uh, and uh, these uh, changes, uh, they are also uh, go going to be a big uh, health uh, problem worldwide. And, uh, and uh, there are many areas where we cannot produce uh, enough uh, food for growing population. And uh, that's also contributing to the, uh, the amount of uh, refugees and, uh, and even, even military crises. And it, it, uh, we have uh, up to one billion potential climate re refugees, and, and, and there's also this health, uh, health uh, effect uh, embedded. At WMO, uh, we are uh, friends of uh, concrete uh, action. This UN system uh, where we are working, it's very much uh, blamed uh, that we are, we are talking and, uh, and we are working in, in, in silos. And from WMO's side, we are eager to build uh, partnerships with uh, UNEP, uh, FAO, and World uh, Health Organization and World Food Programme. To, to go for concrete, uh, concrete action, and, and, uh, and uh, our idea is to promote uh, weather, climate, and health services at country level, and, uh, and, and we are eager to seek for resources from, uh, from uh, our development partners to achieve this. And by doing so, also this UN system could show that we are doing something reasonable at country level, and, uh, and we are not... Uh, working in, in, in silos, and that's, that's what we are going to promote uh, from WMO's side. So this was my, my, my intervention, and uh, thanks for listening to this, and uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Thales. I now invite Dr. Andy Haynes, Professor of Public Health and Primary Kerr London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to make his scientific keynote presentation. Dr. Haynes, the floor is yours. Well, many thanks, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow panelists. Uh, it's a great pleasure, a great honor for me to give you a brief presentation about the linkages between environmental change and human health, and also to suggest some strategies which could help both to improve health, sustain the gains that we've already made, and also protect the environment. And I want to start by um, acknowledging the great work of UNEP colleagues in preparing this most um, useful report. You've already heard from Dr. Chan some of the headline figures, perhaps around 12.6 million deaths a year due to modifiable environmental factors. And this slide shows you the global distribution of those deaths. So you can see, for example, 3.8 million in the Southeast Asia region, 3.5 in the Western Pacific, 2.2 in Africa, and so on. But even in uh, places like Europe, very substantial numbers of deaths due to environmental uh, factors. So it's important to understand what is contributing to this burden of environmental disease. We've heard quite a lot already about air pollution. This is fine particulate air pollution, which affects every one of us but of course is particularly intense in household environments in low-income countries, also in the growing cities. Very few of us who live in cities actually are exposed to levels of air pollution below the WHO guidelines. So this is a pervasive problem. It's getting worse in many parts of the world. The recent WHO data suggests an 8% increase in environmental exposure to air pollution. We also know about 4.1 billion people have been injured or left homeless, need of emergency care as a result um, of weather-related disasters over the last 20 years. And a number of other challenges are summarized on this slide. But we're also 
Uh, there are areas that we don't have very good figures on, like waste management, where we know a lot of people are affected. Their daily lives are affected by um, dump sites. Uh, and 42 million tonnes of e-waste are piling up uh, annually. So we're storing up new problems for the future, uh, which will affect particularly uh, children, but also the general uh, population. So we've achieved a great deal, and we have seen advances in health. But now we're really confronted by a new set of problems, unsustainable environmental trends. Climate change is argu arguably the most important, but it's not the only one. We've heard about burgeoning tropical forest loss, water shortages, so three billion people around the world exposed to varying degrees of water shortage because in many parts of the world we're exploiting finite freshwater resources which cannot be replenished on human life scales. Ocean acidification, our oceans are becoming progressively more acid. We still don't fully understand uh, the, what the effects that will have on marine ecosystems but it's certainly going to be part of the transformation of our, research, of our oceans in concert with overfishing. Temperature change, we've heard that we could be heading still to three degrees, depending on how much we can build on the successes of Paris. And of course, biodiversity is declining at very rapid rates indeed. Achim Stein has mentioned the importance of, of emerging diseases, many of which are zoonotic. We've seen the example of Ebola, and that didn't just kill people just from Ebola, but also because the health system collapsed, the fragmented and weakened health system collapsed under the burden, and of course many people died of other preventable diseases. Many of these emerging diseases are related to transformation of our landscapes for agricultural purposes, deforestation, and so on. Let me just give you a couple of other very specific examples of the health impacts of global environmental change. One of them is the inability to work due to thermal stress. That's to say heat overload. Now if you're a subsistence farmer in a low-income country or an outdoor laborer, you often have very little choice as to when you work. The top part of the slide shows you the proportion of the uh, hottest months that can be worked uh, at the moment. And you can see that much of that is green and yellow. So much of the time people can work, although they are exposed to very high levels of thermal stress. But if you look at the bottom part of the slide, that tells us what could, <coughs> excuse me, could happen with three degrees of warming. And you can see that uh, under those conditions, quite substantial parts of the world are covered by a band of thermal stress, which means it will be very difficult to work for more than perhaps 20% of the time in the hottest months. And that will have profound effects on the economy and particularly the incomes uh, of the poorest. I also wanted to emphasize, we've heard a lot about the effects of climate change, which is extremely important, of course, um, but there's also the effects of other um, ecological changes. And in the commission that I chaired last year, the Lancet Rockefeller Commission on Planetary Health, we looked at the range of environmental factors uh, that could affect human health. And one of them was biodiversity loss. And this slide just illustrates uh, the effects of the loss of pollinator species. Now, pollinators like bees, um, butterflies, hummingbirds, and so on, help to pollinate many crops that are vital for human health and nutrition. And this slide just illustrates, it's from a study published in The Lancet at the time of our commission report from Harvard colleagues, and it shows you where the likelihood is that there will be increases in non-communicable diseases, that's to say heart disease and uh, cancer and, and diabetes, as a result of the dietary changes from the loss of pollinators particularly the reduction in fruit and vegetable. Now, fruit and vegetables are very important for protecting us against some of these diseases. But in addition, the bottom part of the slide shows you where uh, populations are likely to experience increased malnutrition due to reductions in vitamin A or other micronutrients, because many of these crops depend on pollinators. 
So what do we need to do in order to try and tackle some of the root causes of these environmental changes, protect the environment and support and safeguard human health? There are four key messages from the report. One of them is to decouple economic uh, growth, human progress from environmental damage and that will require changes in lifestyles for many of us, to detoxify our economies, to reduce exposure to chemical and other pollutants, and to decarbonize rapidly in order to avoid and reduce as much as possible the risks of dangerous climate change. But that can bring with it benefits, as we've already heard, benefits in terms of near-term improvements in human health. And then we need to enhance ecosystem resilience so that we can protect vulnerable populations against the damage that's already done and cannot easily be reversed. So very briefly, we need to develop sustainable and healthy cities. Over 70% of greenhouse gas emissions come from cities. Most of our economic activities are driven by the urban economies. So we need to implement clean and sustainable transport systems, emphasizing public transport, preferably low carbon, more walking and cycling because many societies have a heavy burden of disease from sedentary lifestyles and realistically the only time people can take physical activity is during the course of their daily life as they go to work or to school or whatever. So we have to create safer opportunities for walking and cycling. Access to clean energy. We are beginning to understand that green spaces can also bring health benefits particularly, for example, to mental health from access to green spaces in cities and also reduce the urban heat island effect, in other words, the increased thermal stress that occurs uh, for people living in urban areas. To conserve watersheds, about 30% of our great cities depend on fresh water from local protected areas and to increase resilience to floods, storms and droughts. We need to take into account the health economic benefits, as we've already heard uh, from Costa Rica, big um, imposition on our economies of the health effects of uh, air pollution. But when we start to take into account, we start to value the benefits of lowering air pollution, this can have benefits to our economy that usually exceed the abatement costs, as illustrated in these figures here, 50 to 380 ton, uh, dollars per tonne of CO2 abated, uh, depending on the locality and so on. And implementing renewable energy, uh, as shown on this slide, can also bring big benefits in terms of avoided health costs. But it's not just carbon dioxide mitigation, it's also the mitigation of short-lived climate pollutants, such as black carbon and to some extent tropospheric or low-level um, ozone. And this slide just summarizes research that's been done came from a UNEP report a few years ago showing that reducing black carbon emissions can prevent 2.4 million premature deaths annually, many in children and women, from exposure to uh, high levels of black carbon, particularly in households but also outdoors. And some of the measures are illustrated on this slide, particularly cleaner cooking solutions, reduced agricultural burning, removing the big smokers, the very polluting diesels, and improved brick kilns, and so on. So there are many measures that can be taken to reduce short-lived climate pollutants that are being promoted by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition hosted by UNEP. We also know that our food systems, our food and agricultural systems, are in many cases dysfunctional. They produce food that's not necessarily healthy food, and we still have um, nearly a billion people suffering from severe undernutrition, including compromising the future prospects of many young children. And we know that 30% of the world's total agricultural land is used to produce food that is never eaten. So we need to reduce food waste through a variety of strategies, but also to promote healthy, sustainable diets, because much of the grain that we do produce, of course, is not directly fed to humans. It goes sometimes into biofuels, corn alcohol, and sometimes to feed animals. And that results in a lot of conversion inefficiencies as well as um, increased um, greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to be promoting lower emission, healthier diets that can both improve health 
uh, and reduce the environmental footprint of the food and agricultural system. We need to move towards sustainable, healthy economies, uh, so recycling, reusing, remanufacturing, doing so with very strict environmental and occupational controls to reduce exposure to toxic pollutants. One good example of where we can do that is by recycling water, making water, wastewater into a resource uh, rather than something to be avoided. And also we can capture the methane emissions from that wastewater, generate clean energy. There's emerging evidence that forest conservation can reduce disease risks. For example, this study from the Brazilian Amazon showed reduced malaria transmission, reduced air pollution from less forest fires, fewer acute um, respiratory infections, and less diarrheal, diarrheal disease because of cleaner water, because intact forests can filter water. We also know that ecosystem strategies can increase disaster resilience. For example, wetlands, mangroves can increase resilience to sea level rise and to tidal waves and so on. And coral reefs provide sanctuary for fish that many, many, many people depend on for their nutrition. We need to create more resilient health systems that can withstand environmental stresses that are more adaptive. They can deliver a range of services with universal health coverage. They can rapidly deploy resources from beyond the health system to tackle emergencies. And through better disease surveillance systems, they can detect and act on health threats before they become really serious. And finally, of course, we need to acknowledge that the Sustainable Development Goals provide a framework from which we can tackle health and environmental challenges in an integrated way. Only one of the SDGs, of course, specifically mentions health, uh, focusing on health care, but that also has a target on reduction um, in exposure to pollution, including air pollution. But all of the other SDGs are directly and indirectly related to health through clean energy, through more sustainable agricultural systems, through sustainable cities, protecting marine and terrestrial ecosystems, and reducing climate change. So health, then, is a cross-cutting integrator across the SDGs, and it's through implementing this whole suite of SDGs in an integrated way that we can protect the environment uh, and safeguard human health. So thank you very much for your attention, but let me close by saying that it's very clear from what I've said that health cannot be the sole responsibility of ministers of health. And the decisions and the policies that you implement over coming years will have profound implications for the health of current and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Haynes, for your presentation. I would like to thank all the speakers for the contributions to this dialogue. I now invite all of you to proceed to the roundtables, requesting your active participation in the dialogue, sharing your experiences, and looking for opportunities to broaden this agenda and promoting the application of an integrated approach. The results of your discussions will be reflected in the UNEA final report and the main conclusions will be shared during the plenary closing session. Before adjourning this meeting, I call up to the Secretary of the Assembly to provide practical information on the arrangements for the delegations to attend either of the two ministerial roundtables and other information he may have. Please. Thank you very much, distinguished President of the Assembly. Uh, this is to remind delegates that Roundtable 1 will be co-chaired by His Ex Her Excellency Dr. Masemuhe Ebtekar, Vice President of Iran, and His Excellency Mr. Daniel Ortega Pacheco, Minister of Environment of Ecuador. Roundtable 1 will take place in Conference Room 1, and the delegations that are invited to rejoin Roundtable 1 are those placed from South Africa to France, meaning the later part of the Assembly. South Africa to France, you are invited to join Roundtable 1. In addition, 
the major groups of local governments and women, the UN agencies, FAO, UNFPA, and the observers of Holy See, European Union, and the State of Palestine are also invited to join Round Table 1. With regards to Round Table 2, which takes place in this conference room, it will be co-chaired by Her Excellency Ms. Edna Molewa, Minister of Environmental Affairs of South Africa, and His Excellency Mr. Johan Flashbart, State Secretary, Federal Ministry of the Environment, Nature Conservation, Building and Nuclear Safety, Germany. So the member states that are requested to remain here are from Gabon to Somalia. You are invited to remain here seated and also all the stakeholders, major groups and UN organizations, you are invited to remain in this room and approach, if you wish so, uh, the, uh, the seats that will be left vacated by the member states that will join Roundtable 1. On the request to take the floor, as was communicated yesterday, the member states, observers, major groups and UN organizations that yesterday were not able to present their contributions are invited and have been inscribed in a speaker's list that is here next to the podium and will be for Roundtable 1 next to the podium in Roundtable 1. So your names have already been recorded and uh, that is the order that will be followed. But if additional requests to take the floor shall be communicated not through the re request electronic system but directly near the podium, round table one and round table two. Those are the announcements, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Secretary. Therefore, the meeting is adjourned.